Good evening, everybody. We want to welcome you to our midweek service, and uh, glad you tuned in to be with us tonight. As we go to the Lord in prayer tonight, we want to just mention something for most of you probably have heard that uh, Brother John Adams passed away last night. Uh, he uh, had uh, they were in surgery, and he knew that when he went in, he might not make it, and Melody and John had talked about it, and uh, he said, if I make it, go home with you, that's fine. If I go home to be with Jesus, that's fine also. So we, uh, we want to be in prayer for Melody and, and all the family, and May God will just be with them, and we've lost a dear brother, and we, we uh, are saddened by that, but we know that he's with the Lord. Amen. So let's pray tonight before we get started. Father, we just thank you and praise you, God, that in this life we can meet a Savior. And so when we come to the end of the life that you've given us, Lord, that we don't have to worry, we don't have to fret. We know, God, that you've got a place prepared for us that where we will live for all of eternity with you, Father. We pray for Melody and all of her family, God, tonight as they mourn, Lord, the loss of John. And we as a church family, as we mourn his loss also, God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit bring peace and comfort to all. God, we ask tonight that you'll bless and anoint this message that it'll minister to our souls. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Praise God. Tonight, we want to talk about a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm amused that sometimes I come up with sayings and I, I keep forgetting, I'm probably speaking to a, to a crowd many times that are uh, not as old as I am and they don't remember the sayings that I remember. And uh, uh, one of them is a the saying that you might, some of you might remember is Houston, we've got a problem. And that was when one of the, uh, one of the uh, spacecrafts went up in the air and they radioed back to Houston, the headquarters there, right quickly that we have got a problem. I don't remember what that problem was. And I don't remember the outcome of it, but I do remember that saying. Well, tonight I want to talk about sin. Sin is a problem. So, world, we have got a problem. As I read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus is giving instruction on how to... Uh, alleviate that problem in your life, how to make heaven your eternal home. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate, for straight is, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth into life, and few there be that find it. Sin has always been a problem. Even before the world began, as we know it, sin was a problem. Lucifer, one of the three archangels in heaven, gave way to pride and greed and declared war on God. Or in other words, he wanted to do it his way instead of God's way. And I want you to remember that right there. He wanted to do it his way instead of God's way. And when he got to earth, he became Satan and he found the first two people and he went to work and he hasn't let up yet. And he won't stop till the last two people. And uh, until he's cast into the lake of fire that God has prepared for him and his angels. So we know his outcome, it's not good for him. And that will be his final abode. And then sin will cease to be a problem. But until then, see, sin is gonna be a problem. And uh, there, I heard a saying many years ago, I think the first time I heard it, a lady in our church, uh, we had a couple named Brother and Sister Richardson, wonderful preacher and uh, people of God. One night we was talking about sin and she, uh, gave out this saying, which was, she didn't make it, many people know it, but I really have hung on to it through the years. So there is something to be said about sin. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will take you places you don't want to go, and sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And uh, the devil never tells you that. He always tells you that there's pleasure in sin, like it says in Hebrews, there's pleasure in sin, but the last part of that verse says it's only for a season. So if we can grasp that concept that the allurement of sin that Satan wants to bring people into is just a deception. It's a deception. He may present it to you as though it's going to be a long-lasting thing, but that pleasure and that sin soon comes to an end. And that's the first thing I want to talk about tonight, that sin is deceptive, and, and the reason Satan is a liar and the father of all lies. We find that in John 
8:44, that he's the deceiver. He deceived Adam and Eve, and, and uh, deceive means to cause someone to believe something that is not true. And uh, so he is, he is that great deceiver. He caused Adam to believe that God didn't mean what he said. He caused, Ad, he caused Eve to believe that God didn't mean what he said. I, anytime you, you hear that, and, and the devil's telling people that all the time, and, and people believe it. Because a lot of people today know what sin is. They know they shouldn't do something because God has given them a conscience, but he will try to deceive them and think, well, that really doesn't apply to you or it doesn't apply to the age that we live in. But it does because if it was sin then, it's still sin now. He tried to convince Eve that there wouldn't be a penalty for sin, uh, which was disobeying God, disobeying the command of God. He, he said, no, no, there won't be any penalty for it, but he lied, amen. And uh, there is a payday for sin. We find in Romans 8, 20, or 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But sin is deceptive, and it has, it has a payday. There is a payday for sin. The wages of it is death. So the soul that sinneth, it shall die, the Scripture says. Amen. Now, I, I looked through the various kinds of sin that we might go through with, because he, he deceives somebody every time they enter into one of these sins. The person that wants to tell a lie. He deceives them and he tells them, it's your only way out. If you're going to get out of this mess, you've got to lie about it. You've got to lie about it. A thief. He tells the thief, he said, if you, you have a need of that, if you really want that, the only way you're ever going to get it is, to, is just to take it. Amen. And the murderer, he comes along and he said, when you kill this person, that will solve all of your problems because they'll be out of your life and they won't bother you anymore. Fornication. And it won't matter because everybody's done it. That's a common lie that we see in the world today. And fornication is, is such a widespread thing today that people don't think anything at all about it. Adultery. The devil tells the, the people that are getting ready to commit adultery that we will be wiser than other people and when we cheat on our spouses and, and we won't get caught. Lie. What a lie. What a lie. The smoker. Whether smoking is a sin or not, it's a very detrimental thing to your health. He said, it looks cool. It looks cool. I can remember back in the 50s and 60s uh, on uh, TV programs and commercials and movies, it, it was always cool to, to be able to smoke and didn't show them years later when they were, were dying of, of lung cancer. And the alcoholic, he tells that alcoholic the first time he wants to start drinking, it's a, it's a, it, it'll give you a good time. I can remember when I was a little boy growing up, there was a, a beautiful commercial. It was a beautiful commercial. And it showed a picture of beautiful mountain setting and a beautiful uh, mountain lake, snow-capped mountains and a beautiful glassy lake. And the guy was riding in that boat and, and fishing. And, and uh, it was a Ham's beer commercial. And, and it told him how good that life would be if he had a ham's beer. And, uh, but there again, that alcoholic would tell you it's a different story. It's not a, different, it's not, not a beautiful life to be an alcoholic. I, I know some older people who were alcoholics. Been, most of them, uh, some of them were alcoholics for many, many, many years. And it, it would destroy their life. And unfortunately, I can tell you some young people today that are alcoholics in their teens and in their 20s, they've already become alcoholics. Uh, they're bound by this thing, and it's taking them down a road that's going to lead them to, a, to destruction and a devastated life. And then the drug user. They always, Satan always lies and tells you that when you want to think you want to start dabbling in drugs, whether it's marijuana, will lead to something else or something else. They all, he always tells you that you won't become addicted. You, you can handle it. You can handle it. Uh, he's been deceiving people from the very, the very beginning of time. Every generation, generation before your generation, your generation, the generation after you, he will continue to deceive. Amen. But so, sin will always deceive the person who is not fully connected to God. So the problem of sin is always going to be there. The antidote to sin is, is staying away from it. Just stay away from these things. And Satan has tried to convince you that they're okay. Because he will deceive you into believing a lie. And uh, so the best way to do that is to stay connected to God the very best that you can. The closer you're connected to God, the more less, less apt you are to begin involved in these things. Because your life is fulfilled with the presence of God. And sin is also deafening. It will, it will uh, 
uh, shut your ears up to the truth. The sinner can't hear the voice of God, nor the plan or the direction that God has for them for their life. John 10, verse 4 through 14, I'm not going to read it all, but it talks about the, uh, the, the good shepherd. And said the sheep know the voice of the shepherd, and uh, only the children of God can hear, can hear God's voice. If you're, if you're not connected to God, if you're not saved, you're not a person that loves God and serving God, you're not going to hear the voice of God. The only voice you're going to hear is that one of Satan that's lying to you, deceiving you. It's amazing to me how many people I've, I've talked to over the years, and whether it be alcohol or drugs or, or immorality or living together outside of wedlock. And I've talked to him. I said, do you, do you know that that is sin? And I have many of them look me square in the eye and say, no. And I really believe that they didn't, believe, didn't know that that was sin. Well, the Bible's full of it. It tells you over and over again that this thing, these things are sin and, and that they will destroy you. But we've got a culture now that has been raised up uh, after the second and third generation of a lifestyle that has become so accepted to them that they don't know it's sin. They literally don't know it's sin. But yet I believe somehow the consciousness that's with inside them is going to reveal it to them. And they need to answer to that consciousness. The sinner puts his hands over his ear when God speaks. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to we which are saved it is the power of of God. The only time the sinner can hear the voice of God is when Jesus is saying, come unto me. The only time they'll really hear God is when the convicting spirit of God gets a hold of their heart and says, and he's drawing them. He, he's drawing them into relationship with God. God wants to reach out to you. God wants to reach out and draw the sinner out of a world of sin into a relationship with God. That's what God wants to do. That's why he sent Christ that's why there's churches in the world. That's why people preach the gospel. That's why people teach the word. That's why Christians live the life as an example and to show people that Christ is the answer. Amen. And uh, but God's under no obligation to answer the prayer of a sinner. The only one that God really wants to answer first and foremost is that one, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Amen. And the Father will forgive you. James uh, chapter 1 verse 7 says, The man that uh, is wavering is unstable in all of his ways. And, and God has uh, no reason. He says, that, Let not, not that man think that he'll receive anything from God. So it's deafening. A sinner can't hear the voice of God only when God says, Come unto me. A sin is, is devastating. It's devastating. I tell you, we look around this world today and we see the things that Satan is in, injecting into our society. The lives that it's literally destroying. It's a very devastating thing. John 10 and 10, Jesus told us, he said, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, part two of that verse says, Jesus said, But I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But tonight, I just want to talk about the devastating part, the part where he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Because we've got a problem, and that problem is sin. And we need to avoid sin. We need to get away from sin. We need to annihilate sin. Amen. Because the sin will uh, steal your joy. It'll steal that joy. You know, it, it might look like joy when you first get into it. Now, that brings me to the thought of the joy ride. It, I don't think they do that anymore. But... Uh, People, I won't say teenagers, used to steal cars, maybe a fast car, or a hot car, and, and, and just take it for a ride. And man, they'll, they'll go along, and man, their hair's blowing in the breeze, they're having a blast, and they're, they're really living it up. They think it's wonderful, and that's why they call it a joy ride. Until that highway patrolman gets behind him and pulls him over, puts the handcuffs on him, takes him down to the county jail, throws him behind iron bars, and the joy of the ride is over. And that's what sin will do. It will steal your joy. It will steal your accomplishments. As we get started in life, you may have a plan for your life, but you want to uh, build a good life and have a good, uh, good future and do great things in your life. And sin will come along. And I, I, I'm thinking of people that have been very successful in their field, whether it was in sports or in, in business or whatever it might have been, any, any kind of business, and, and they would get 
uh, to where they would start drinking a little bit to, to ease the pain and, and all of a sudden they, they begin to lose out on their, their careers because that alcohol had taken over. It'll, it'll, sin will, 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 you'll lose your friends and your family and, and, and as, as sin comes in and separates people, separates people from the relationship with other people. You, you can't live a very rebellious life and expect those who are your family and your friends to want to be around you all the time. It, it will separate. It doesn't mean your family won't always love you, but unfortunately it just means they won't always be able to enjoy you. Because not necessarily, I've seen this many times, that not necessarily the, the family will draw away from the person that's really wound up in sin, but that person will draw away from the family. They'll walk away from the family because the family can't accept the lifestyle they've, they've uh, been involved in. The fa family can't support them in their drugs and their alcohol and their, and their losing one job after another and living the life that they're living. The family just says, we can't accept that. And that person will walk away from that family. That family that they were brought into as a little baby and grew up and had a wonderful life going for them. And sin got a hold of that person and it drew them away from their family. And they have no family and they have no friends. And it'll destroy their future. The future will be, be bleak. It'll be, it'll be blackened. You know, the future of doing something great and living a great life and having a great life. It'll, it won't be there anymore because sin has taken that away. It will steal these things from you. It, it will kill. It will kill what you are. You'll no longer be able to function as you're supposed to because sin has come in and taken that away from you. It will kill what you would have become. You're, you're, you're getting better and better at what you do. It will cease because sin will kill that. It will it'll kill your, your integrity. It will kill your dignity. Amen. You'll, you'll get to the place in sin to where you don't even want to look yourself in the mirror. Look at yourself in the mirror. You'll come to the place to where you just wish life would come to an end. And that's why people commit suicide sometimes because sin has brought them to a place to where they can't stand to even face another day. Sin will kill that hard time of living and existing with it. And if you... Uh, it will leave you laying in an open grave and when you're dead, but you just don't know it yet. It'll take you to an all-time low and you just don't really realize how low you really are. I think sometimes that's the only time people come out of that situation is when they, when they wake up and they realize, I have hit rock bottom. The prodigal son, for example. He didn't realize that he was dying day by day by day until he got to the place to where he was uh, feeding the, the swine and wanting to eat the, the, the husk that the, the swine would eat. And finally he reached the lowest place and he realized he needed to come back home. It will destroy you. Remember the verse I gave you, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief will come along and and he'll fill in the ditch. He will, he will finally get you down so low in your, in your uh, existence that he'll actually fill in the ditch. He'll throw the dirt in your face. He'll cover you up. Amen. And, and, uh, and not even put up a tombstone. He'll just smooth out the dirt, plant the grass over the top. And we'll look out there and we won't even see a remembrance of you. Yeah, I mean, you're gone. He wants to destroy you. And I, I always said it this way that how, how can he destroy you? He can wipe out all memory of who you were that you ever even existed. What a terrible, terrible, tragic end. Amen. That people will not remember the good you did. If they remember you at all, it'll only be the devastating downfall that you had from allowing sin to take over your life and to bring you to an all-time low. They'll remember what you did, maybe. But then pretty soon they won't remember you at all. Your, your life, your name, your family, your future will all be something that's totally, totally gone. Amen. The good person that you, uh, that you were going to be once will never, ever happen. Totally wiped out. Totally annihilated. The memory of the person that God intended that you to be will be no more. I want to say that once more. The memory of the person that God intended for you to be will be no more. If people do remember you, 
they'll remember you and the downslide that took you away from this life. And the problem is that we live in a society that has put up with, uh, has put their seal of approval on all kinds of sin. This world is filled with sin. Every, every kind of unimaginable sin that you can think of is in the world today and it's active. And, and you know what amazes me? It's not hidden behind closed doors anymore. There are things that we accept today. There are things today that are promoted as being good and decent and the way that life should be that wouldn't even have been mentioned when I was a boy growing up. It was, it was hidden behind at the very best closed doors and people didn't even want to acknowledge it because it was sin. They knew it was sin. Everybody used to know that it was sin. But now it's been, it's been okay. The stamp of approval has been on, uh, on all these sins by, by Washington, yes, my goodness, by Hollywood, and sometimes even the church. There are things that are accepted in some churches today that are outright blatant sin. The Bible itself brings out the point that these are among the things that people will die and spend eternity in hell for and church organizations have okayed them, blessed them and ordained them. This man, it's uh, unbelievable. It's unbelievable. There's things like murder. Oh, nobody accept murder. But yet we kill thousands of babies every year through the act of abortion. I, I, I got a good report on that. Abortion is on the decline. Thank God for that. Homosexuality, which up until just a few years ago, everybody knew that homosexuality was wrong. It's not a natural thing. It, it goes against the Word of God, and the Word of God brings it out many places that homosexuality is a sin, and it's a sin that will take you to hell. Adultery and fornication, as I, as I already said, uh, you know, that uh, people are involved in this today and they think nothing of it at all, nothing of it at all. When I was a boy growing up, if something like that would happen to people living together, it was called shacking up. Today it's just called normal. It's called normal. Well, it's not normal in the eyes of God. There was a TV show that came out a few years ago. I don't even know if I ever, ever seen it. I don't think I did. Uh, if I'd probably started watching it, I'd have probably turned it off. But the TV showed this happily divorced. That was the name of the TV show, Happily Divorced. I know very few, if any, divorce situations to where they're happy because of it. It always leaves a problem. It always leaves a, an injury in somebody's life, you know. Oh, the husband might be happy that he got rid of the wife and she's not happy because she's raising the kids by herself. Well, the wife might be actually happy because she left the husband and she went out and found a rich guy and she's got everything going, but the kids, the kids aren't happy. I, I don't care. I talked to a young man a few years ago, and he said, I asked him just kind of how is it, you know, you, Christmas time, man, you get, you get several different opportunities to go to different places and to receive all these different gifts from two or three sets of parents and two or three sets of grandpas and grandmas. And he said, it's not that great. It's not that great. Not what we really, really wanted. Amen. Now we, we preach a doctrine and we, we hear it sometimes that everybody's going to heaven. Well, that's a lie in itself. The Bible plainly says that everybody's not going to heaven. Why? Because of sin. As long as you allow sin to remain in your life and to control your life, you're not going to heaven. I'm, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but sin takes people to hell. Sin has to be repented of. Sin has to be taken out of the life through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you have to surrender your life to Christ. But there's a doctrine that people just think that everybody's going to heaven and uh, uh, that that's just the way life is. You're born and you grow up and, and you, uh, you're going to heaven. Well, the Bible speaks of a lot of people that aren't going to make heaven. And I, I've said this many, many times. I, I've preached lots of funerals. Since I've been in Versailles, Missouri the last 31 years, I've preached somewhere between three and 400 funerals. And I do not remember ever anyone saying that that person was lost, they were going to die and go to hell. They always think that they're in a better place now. I've preached funerals of people that uh, their lives were pretty rough. I mean, they were involved in a lot of sin. Now, I never preached them into heaven. But people think, no matter where, who you are, what life you live, that when you die, you go to heaven. That's simply not the truth. Amen. And uh, Jesus was not afraid to offend people. He was not afraid to say sin is destructive. 
He was not afraid to point out to people. As a matter of fact, when he saw the scribes and the Pharisees coming to be baptized, when John was, was baptizing, and, or John said this, when they were baptized, he looked at him and he said, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. He said, where is your act of repentance? Show me some repentance. Show me that your life has changed. You're not the same person that you used to be. And when you come to Christ, that does disappear. You are a different person. But without conviction, that's not going to happen. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. Amen. And uh, we, we live in a society today to where it used to be the kids, especially teen, well, not just teenagers, but predominantly teenagers would want to go somewhere and do something with, with some of their friends and, and the parents wouldn't want them to. And they'd say, well, everybody's doing it. Everybody's going there. Well, that's not the truth. Everybody's not doing it and everybody's not going there. But it seems like adults are falling in that same pattern that everybody's living that lifestyle. It must, must be okay. God must not think that badly of it or he would have wiped everybody out. Amen. But it's just not true. Because Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 says this, The soul that sins will die. It doesn't matter if everybody is doing it. It doesn't matter what society has accepted it doesn't matter what maybe even your church, if your church preaches that sin's okay, then that doesn't make it okay. God and God's Word says that it is not okay. But there is an antidote for the sin problem. And, and, you know, we're going through something right now with this coronavirus, you know, that we wanted an antidote. We wanted a, a, a vaccine. We want a cure for this thing. And we do. We do. We definitely want a cure. But there is an antidote for sin, the sin problem. You, you can get rid of the sin problem, uh, and that is through coming to Jesus Christ. Amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. said, There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Nobody has to stay under the penalty of sin. The name of Jesus Christ can bring you out. Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And John 10 and 10, the second part of that verse I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Christ has come that nobody has to stand under the penalty of sin. Nobody has to continue to live in that life of sin. Christ is reaching out. He said in uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you that labor are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He said, and then he wants us to come to him and ask forgiveness. Simply that. Repent of your sins. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and let him to come into your heart and your life, save you and, and deliver you. And he'll do it. Amen. So Jesus is the answer. You know, when we, when we think that uh, uh, we've got a problem, we've got a problem. Well, along with that problem, we've also got an answer. Yes, sin is a problem, but Jesus is the answer. And if you feel the Spirit of God, like I said, the only prayer really a sinner is going to uh, the only prayer that a sinner is going to pray that God's really going to pay much attention to is the one where he says, God, have mercy on my soul. So tonight in closing, I don't know who I'm speaking to out there, but maybe you need to re reconnect your relationship with God. Maybe you've never been saved the first time, but you're feeling like tonight, I just want to surrender my life to Christ. I want you to pray these words with me and pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you right now in your precious holy name. And I ask that you'll forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Make me a new person. Deliver me from the lifestyle that has me bound. Loose me and give me life and give me hope. And I will praise you for it and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If I hope that somebody prayed that prayer tonight, because uh, that's why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you prayed that prayer tonight and you responded, give me a call. Write us a letter. Send us a note uh, on, the, on the internet there. Uh, punch out you, you like it or make a comment. Make a comment on there and tell me that you gave your life to Christ tonight. Amen. Why don't you come out and be with us Thursday night at 7 o'clock in the CFI Bible study. We sit around the table and drink a cup of coffee and fellowship a little bit. Have a great time of fellowship but a great time in the Word. And back here again Sunday morning, 9 o'clock for Coffee and Donuts, 9.30 Sunday School. Got some great Sunday School uh, classes that you need to be in. And then come 10.30 for the morning worship, and we will be glad to see you. This coming Sunday night, we have a missionary coming, Brother Les Melton. Brother Les Melton has been our missionary for 
Um, oh my goodness, I couldn't tell you how many years he's been in Guatemala, I believe it is. Done a great job there. He's the leader of the missions in that field. So he'll be here with us Sunday night at 6 o'clock. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. Amen.